If you're able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning coming to us from the gospel according to John on this first Sunday of Epiphany. We're going to be in chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we come now with our hearts open, with our ears open, Lord, with our spirits submitted to you, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through these ancient words, ever true, meant to change us, meant not just to inform us, but to transform us, O oh God. So we ask now that you would allow us to hear, allow us to receive what you would speak, that your word, the seed of your word, would take root in our hearts, that it would grow strong and bear fruit in and through our lives for the sake of your kingdom, and your purposes, Lord, for eternal life now and forevermore in fellowship with you. Through the name of the one who is the Son of God, the name of the one by which you have made this possible and by which you have promised you shall bring it to pass for all those who love you and are called according to your purpose. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. In the prologue to John's gospel, what we call chapter one, something that we always uh, read and celebrate around Christmas time. We hear these words, and we'll put these up on the screen for you. You know this scripture. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. The title of this message is The Light Still Shines. And that verse, as John has written it centuries ago, the light shines in the darkness. That verb shines. It is, it is a present ongoing action and reality. It was when John wrote this in the first century, and it is now as we hear it anew in the 21st century. The light continues to shine, and as we just wrapped up the 12 days of, of, of Christmas, we celebrated how what existed in God before the dawn of creation, the one who was in the beginning, the one who was the Word, John calls him, how that existence culminated in the coming of the Word made flesh. All throughout Advent into the Christmas season, we talked about the gift of Emmanuel, who is God with us. That's who Jesus Christ is. And in the mystery and wonder of the one we know as Jesus, God reveals God's self most fully to us as human beings. Is the Bible the clearest revelation of God? No. Jesus Christ is. All scripture is meant to point us to him. All scripture is meant to help us better understand the fullness of, of who God is made manifest in the one who is the eternal son made flesh, born that men no more may die. As John goes on to say in his prologue, like we just heard in verses four and five of chapter one, he, his life, the life of Christ, brought light to everyone. And his light, the light of Christ, still shines in the darkness. Somebody needs to hear that today. 
It still shines. And the darkness can never understand it. We can translate that word in so many ways. The darkness can never understand it, can never extinguish it, can never comprehend it, can never attain it, can never overtake it, can never snuff it out. Not then, not now, not ever. And that's good news. That's good news. COVID can't snuff out the light that still shines. No matter who is president, they cannot snuff out the light that shines. No matter what happens with the economy, it can't snuff out the life that shines, the light that shines. No matter what happens in your life with loss or grief, no matter how much hell you might feel you are walking through right now, the light still shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. As the word made flesh in his first advent, Christ came into this world 2,000 years ago And he still comes by his spirit to make his risen and living presence known to us today, to shine his light upon us, to illuminate the darkness, not only in the world, but the darkness that resides in your heart and in mine. And simply by being who he is, as John calls him the the light of the world, as, as John calls him the way and the truth and the life, When that one makes his presence known to you or to me, do you know what happens? The light of his presence, the first thing that it does is it reveals things as they truly are. In a day and an age where everything is spin, everything is somebody's interpretation, everything is how can I take this story and twist it for my own gain or my own advantage, isn't it refreshing to know that there is one who shines, who will reveal things for who he is and what the truth really is. I hope that encourages you today. I hope that is good news to you because indeed it is meant to be. So when the light shines, the light of his presence and reveals things as they truly are, it begins within our hearts. It begins in yours, it begins in mine, at the deepest, darkest depths of who we are. When the light of Christ shines within a human heart, it will illuminate what lays hidden there, hidden in the darkness. Our sin but also our woundedness, our pain, our grief, but also our hopes, our dreams, our desires, and our longings. One of the ancient confessions of of faith, one of the ancient confessions of, of sin in the church, we start out, we say, Lord, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. When the light shines in the darkness, things are revealed for what they truly are, not only around us, but within us. And the only question is, my friends, how then will we respond? If we keep reading on to John chapter three, as we heard just moments ago, we hear more of John's language of of this light in the darkness through the words spoken by Jesus himself in his conversation with Nicodemus, the, the Pharisee and teacher of ancient Israel. And after teaching Nicodemus of his need and ours to be born again, born anew, born from above, you can translate it any way you want to as Jesus describes it, we have to be born anew to even see the kingdom of God, Jesus says. And it's only through our believing in the Son of Man, in the Son of God, that we may have eternal life, Christ says. And then we get up to John 3.16 right there. Everybody is familiar with John 3.16, right? Probably one of the first Bible verses you ever memorized as a kid in Sunday school. Everyone knows that verse, whether we have any idea what it actually means. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. The word there is monogenes in, in, in Greek. and in, in English, we'd say mono as in one genus, class. This is one and only of a particular kind. The one and only begotten son means Jesus is unique in a very particular way. There is only one of who and what Jesus is. In so many ways, we are meant to be like him, but there is distinctiveness and uniqueness in who he is as the savior of the world, who he is as the son of man, the son of God, and thank God for that truth, that God gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. But what does it mean 
to believe in the Son? Does it mean simply that he exists the way that you believe in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy? Does it mean that you believe that, well, the Son of God is, is, is Jesus? I believe that they're one and the same. Or, or is it more? We'll come back to that and answer that in a few minutes. And what about eternal life? What, what is eternal life? Is it, is it going to heaven when we die and simply living forever? Is eternity just a very, very, very long time? Or is it more than that? Is it something even deeper, something even more real that we are meant to begin to experience not just after we die, but right now? Jesus would later define eternal life in this way, and this is in John chapter 17, the first three verses, when his hour of betrayal had come. He is preparing and praying as he is almost ready to be handed over to those who would arrest him, torture him, and crucify him for your behalf and mine. Jesus prayed these words. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. How is he going to do that? He's going to be crucified. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given. And now he defines it. And this is eternal life. That they may know you. The only true God. And Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So according to Jesus, eternal life is received in knowing God. And not just knowing about God, not just knowing that there is a God, not just having some sort of cerebral uh, ascent that God exists. No. This has to do with knowing God in intimate relationship through the Son, through Jesus Christ. Eternal life is made possible for us through Jesus' offering of his own life upon the cross. This is how he secures it for us. We all know that theology, right? In his obedience, his faithfulness to the Father, Jesus has been raised in all power and all authority. The cross is incomplete without the resurrection. I'm preaching good theology now to give eternal life to anyone who believes in him. Eternal life is more than just living forever spiritually. It has to do with experiencing God. Eternal life has to, know, has to do with knowing him, knowing his presence in our lives and living responsively each day in our living relationship with the living God. That begins now for those who believe. This is why Christ came, after all. This is what Christmas is about. Born that men no more may die, we sing in the carols. All of these things, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. It's not just about how do I get by until I die. It's like now things have changed. Now things are different. Things can be different no matter what may come my way. For I can know God, even in my suffering. I can know God even in my grief, maybe especially in my suffering, maybe especially in my grief. This is why he has come to save us, to bring us into a relationship, to bring us into the experience of what it means to live in the spirit of God, to live in intimate fellowship with him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John 3, 17, Jesus goes on. He says, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. How? Through him. Verse 18, those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already. We'll say more about that in a few moments. Because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So back to what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to believe in the Son? If you say you believe in your doctor, what do you mean? If you say you believe in any human being, that you believe in your husband or your wife, that you believe in your son or your daughter, if you say you believe in, in, in anyone, what, what do you mean? That they exist? That they are somewhere off in the ether watching you over the balcony of, no. That's not at all what we mean when we use that language. It means that we trust that person. We put our faith in 
that person. If we say we believe in someone, it means that we hold their word as good and trustworthy. It means that we can depend upon that person and we put stock in what he does or believe in what she says. That's what it means to believe in someone. So let me ask you, with that understanding, who in the world do you believe in today? What the enemy has done over the last two and a half years is undermine any sense of trust, any sense of belief that we have in anybody in leadership or authority in our culture and in one another. If you want to divide a people, if you want to separate and segregate Let's just say a flock in a church. This is how you do it. You undermine any sense of confidence or trust in anybody with any type of authority or leadership. Now, I'm not saying that those in authority and leadership haven't done plenty of things to deserve that kind of scrutiny. I'm not saying that. But my point is, the enemy has been working overtime for two and a half years. And so many of us as Christians are blind to it. And we've allowed ourselves to be torn apart, to be segregated, to be divided, to be at each other's throats. And the enemy has gained territory the whole way. I believe in 2022, God has had enough. But he's looking for those who are willing to work with him in ways in which he has already established in and through Jesus Christ. What do we mean by this? When it looks at the everyday, what does it mean in our everyday life to believe in Christ? For starters, it means that no matter what, you believe that he died for you. You believe that you are forgiven and redeemed by his blood. That's what we celebrate at the table every single week willingly poured out for your redemption and for mine. The word redeem, what does it mean? It means to buy back. When you were in bondage to slavery and and sin, when you are trapped in your own stuff, God allows his son, Jesus willingly gives up his life to redeem you, to buy you back, to free you from that prison of what? Of darkness. Paul says he has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his glorious light. That is something that Christians, no matter what we experience circumstantially, we should be giving thanks experientially for that reality, for that truth, for that is who we are. And some of the Christians I know who can proclaim that with the most conviction and the most passion are those who have been through the hardest, worst experiences this life could throw at you. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Why did the early church succeed as it did. Because when it came to Roman authorities or Jewish authorities or anybody in authority who would come against them to try to stop what was happening in the life of the church, they said, what do we do? We can't put these people in prison. It doesn't change. We can't kill them. Because when we do, the church only grows. What's different with us today? What's different with the church in America today? Have you considered that? To believe in Christ means, yes, you believe in what he has done for you. But where does that lead us? We are saved from our sin because of what Christ has done, yes. But what are we saved for? What are you saved for? It's not just about what we are saved from. It's what we are saved for. What difference does Christ make in my everyday life right now as he is inviting me into experiencing eternal life beginning now in deepening intimate relationship with him? That's the question I want you to be asking yourself today. And how does he make this happen in my life? Now listen, I know at this point we've we've talked a lot of theology, a lot of doctrine, and that's good and that's right, but this is what we can do as Christians. We can keep it all at a very comfortable arm's length, and we can talk a lot of theology and scripture, and we can keep it all out here, and it's all abstract, and it's theoretical, and we can talk about all this, and yet real life is happening right here. And real life is like, Ben, you don't understand. If I got to go into quarantine one more time, my kids are going to just go crazy. My, my, if, I, if I lose any more work, Ben, it's just, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to lose my car or worse. Uh, ben, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Right now, you don't understand. Right now, does God care? Uh, eternal life is great, but, but right now, my marriage is falling apart. Right now, do you have any idea what it's like? My, my mother is in the throes of dementia, and, and this is getting harder and harder day by day by day. I feel like I lost her months ago, and yet she's still very much with us in body, if not in mind. These are the kinds of things, right, that, that real life 
life gets in the way and real life beats us down, wears us down. The darkness threatens to engulf us. The darkness threatens to encircle us. And we wonder, is the light still shining? The entire purpose behind the incarnation, the entire purpose behind why the word became flesh and lived among us was to enter into all of those details of our lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and to shine the light of God into those dark places so God could make good on his promises to us. And here's what I want us to talk about in the time we have left. God comes to reveal with his light He comes to repair with his love and he comes to restore with the eternal life that he alone can give. So what I want to talk about today in as much of real life, real application as we can muster, I want us to talk about what does it mean for God to reveal? What does it mean for God to repair? What does it mean for God to restore? This is at the heart of the gospel. It's at the heart of who Jesus is, why he has come, and what it means to walk in the way of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God eternally, not only now, but forever. So I want to share an illustration with you if I can. This is as every day as it gets. And uh, we can go ahead and throw that first one up there, Brian, if we can. So this is a picture of a wall in, in our kitchen at home. And in 2016, I think it was, I was at a men's retreat uh, with the church I was serving at that time, and we were in deep in the, in the hollers and hills of Tennessee. I didn't have any cell coverage at all out there, and I was out there for two nights, and uh, by the time I got back to some sort of uh, tech-savvy civilization, my phone was blowing up with text messages from my wife. And uh, Aaron was saying, we have a problem. We have a problem. And so... Somewhere, I think it was on Friday, uh, she and the kids had been in the kitchen and they started noticing all these things flying around in the kitchen. And, and at first they thought they were flies and then they thought they were some sort of, uh, were they gnats? But then they realized, no, these are, they, they called them little bees. Well, what they actually were, were yellow jackets. And, uh, you know, they're not very big, but they pack a punch. If you've ever been stung by a yellow jacket, you, you feel it, you know it. And uh, so what had happened was my wife Erin is, is, is resourceful and she's a hard worker and she, she uh, you know, if there's a problem, she's going to figure out a way to solve it. So she did what anybody would do when they noticed, she and the kids had tracked the bees that were flying around our kitchen, these yellow jackets, that there was, there was a hole in the wall. This is an exterior wall. And it wasn't very big. It was about the, the size of your, your pinky, maybe, the diameter of your pinky. So what do you do when you have a hole in your wall that yellow jackets are entering in your kitchen? You shove paper towels in that thing and duct tape that sucker. <laughs> it gets the job done, right? And it did. It did, right, babe? It made it, made it happen. So, so, so Aaron shoved paper towels in there, took some, some, got some good black Gorilla tape, I think it was, shoved that over the hole, problem solved at least until Ben gets home, right? So I get home late that Saturday afternoon and and I take a look at this and I'm trying to figure out what in the world is behind that wall. And then I'm asking myself, do I really want to take that tape off (laughs) and discover what's behind that wall? Right? And this is what I want you to understand. So much of the time in my life, I, I, when this happened, I was like, I don't have time for this. I think I was, I was preaching the next day and uh, I hadn't slept the last two nights when we did our retreat and, and I was just like, I got other things to do. And, and yet here's the thing. I think I'm learning that when interruptions come in our lives, God has something to teach us. God has a way to reveal himself to us if we will receive it, if we will listen, if we will pay attention. And that's exactly what I was about to learn in this process. So I left the tape on there on Saturday. <laughs> we, we had worship the next day and spent time with our church family. And, and then that afternoon I came home and, and I said, well, let's see what this reveals. And I started to pull away the tape. So the question is, when we start to ask this question, what will be revealed? Will we accept God's invitation when his light shines? Will we trust him? 
Will we open our eyes that we may see what's really there, that we may see the truth, and then will we allow God to do something about it? Because once God in our hearts, once he starts peeling back the layers, listen to me, it might hurt. It might get a little ugly. <laughs> it might reveal all kinds of brokenness that, that some that we knew was there, but there might be a whole lot more there that we didn't understand or realize. There might be some destruction hidden beneath the surface, hiding in the darkness, our darkness. So if this wall was your heart or was my heart, when I started peeling back the layers, here's what happened. This is how it started. So where that hole had been, right in the top right-hand corner where that white meets the red, and you start to see, this is what, if you've ever seen a yellow jacket hive, this is what it is. And you can see the light switch uh, right there to the left. I mean, this is a, a piece that's barely a foot tall and, and about eight inches wide. And as I, I walked over, here's what happened. That, that hole that was duct taped, I, I didn't know it until I actually touched the thing. I could take, I poked my finger right through nothing but a layer of red paint. What you could see on the surface was just a little bit. The truth is, there was nothing but a thin facade, a thin veneer about the size of a basketball of red paint. The yellow jackets had eaten through the drywall on the other side. Apparently, you know, the drywall was delicious and non-toxic, but the paint was too far. I don't know. But that's, that's <laughs> I don't know what yellow jackets are thinking. But that's what happened. And stop and think about that. How many of us, how many of us right now are living our lives and there is this thin veneer like that red paint that's all we have on the surface? And it's like if one more thing goes sideways, if one more thing goes wrong, that, that's going to break. And so maybe today, God is saying, let my light shine upon your life. Let my light shine within your heart because this is, gonna, this is gonna come apart one way or another. And if you let me do this, if you let me reveal myself to you and reveal what I want to heal and repair within you, what did we say? Take my hand, precious Lord. Take my hand. The question is, will you take his He's offering you his. He is reaching out to you right now. Will you grab hold and say, I don't want to let go. Lord, keep me from letting go. As I started to peel back, you can see how the got bigger and bigger. So now this is 32 inches across. You can see the insulation. Now I'm starting to see how bad this is. The moisture from that hive. When living things live in your wall, they're not supposed to. They put out <laughs> all kinds of moisture. What happened with the insulation? You can see the hive on the left side. You can see how it's getting bigger and bigger. And now I'm starting to say to myself, what have I gotten into? I knew I couldn't just you know, plug the hole and move on and pretend like it wasn't there. But now this is commitment. This is getting uh, worse before it gets better. As we kept going... You can see right here, that little yellow circle, that was how the yellow jackets got in. There was one little, about the size of a pen, hole through the exterior wall. And as, oh, I forgot to tell you, one thing that Aaron did, Aaron loves, she loves animals, kind of. <laughs> but before she plugged that hole with paper towels, she took about two cans of Raid and sprayed them in that hole. So there were many, many deceased yellow jackets in, in the wall. Uh, and, and I couldn't tell how much of the moisture they created or how much, you know, I don't know, 84 ounces of Raid creates when <laughs> you spray that in an almost enclosed space. But this is what happened as this little hive uh, grows from this little hole and it becomes quite <laughs> a great hive. And so one more slide on this section here. You can see here's the larva. So here's the young ones. I mean, this was, this was a mess. All kinds of infestation, all kinds of destruction. And here's the thing. I mean, at this point, I, I, it, was, it was a full day of just how do I clean this up? How do I begin to take this apart? How, do, how far is this going to go? How much is this going to cost me? Question after question after question, right? And maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been through this kind of project with your home. Maybe you've been through this kind of project with a car. It's like, man, it's still moving. It's still moving. I don't want to check out what that noise is. I don't want to deal with what's going on here. I don't care what the mechanic told me. I don't want to deal with that because once I start, how far is it going to go? Now, this is what happens. 
This is why many people never get beyond this step when it comes to how God works to bring healing in our lives. We'll stop the process short almost every time. We pull out the duct tape, we use all of it we can find, and we do everything we can find to just patch ourselves up. You ever been there? This is, this is how, I believe, how our society functions right now. We duct tape ourselves together, we patch ourselves up with all kinds of things, all kinds of substances, whatever it takes to get us through, right? Whatever we gotta do to distract ourselves, whatever we gotta do to numb the pain, whatever we gotta do to convince ourselves, man, somehow I can get through this. All kinds of activities, all kinds of relationships, whatever it takes. And we just try to keep it together, and that's, that's what duct tape does, right? So never mind what's happening beneath the surface, beneath that veneer, that facade that we all wear. Never mind what's being chewed up, turned to dust, dying inside of us. In him was life, and the life was the light of all men, John said. So why do we do this? We can have the right theology, we can have the right doctrine, and yet we still live this way. Why do we do it? Because sometimes, like I said, it can be painful when light shines in the darkness. You remember when you were 14 years old and your mom or dad would come in your room and you were sound asleep and they'd flip on the lights and say, get up, it's one o'clock on a Saturday. <laughs> Dylan, I've had to do that a time or two lately, but no. And that light just hits you in the face. It's not pleasant. A searing light pierces through. It's, it's painful. Or it can be simply that I don't want to deal with what I know is there. If it's my sin or if it's my wounds as a consequence of another sin, if it's my hurt, if it's my anger, oh man, we live in a society where people want to be angry and they want to hang on to that anger and justify it in whatever way it takes. Maybe I don't want to deal with my unforgiveness toward another. Ben, if you knew, if you knew what that person did, yes, but what did Jesus do for you? I, that, that's, that's Jesus. I'm talking about what that person did. These are the things that keep us trapped, keep us locked in darkness that we don't want the light of God to reveal. Or perhaps we're afraid. We're afraid of what the light will show, and we tell ourselves the pain of staying the same, well, it has to be less than the pain of change. The older I get in my own life, the more people I walk with through life, I, I, I believe that, that we, when we believe that the pain that we're going through right now is still less than the pain of, of living differently, we won't change. And we will fight God with tooth and nail when God promises to move in our lives to bring change. We don't even have to do it in our own strength, but we will take all of our strength to resist him. When we live that way, we're not really living at all. It's the opposite of eternal life. It's just existence. It's breathing. It's survival. That is not what Jesus means by eternal life. And like John said, we are condemning ourselves in a way that God does not. Because when we are not believing in Jesus, as we are invited to, we are not taking him at his word. We are not trusting him. We are not putting our faith in who he is and what he can do in our hearts and lives. It, it, it is one thing to see, it is another thing to surrender. It is one thing to come on Sunday morning and yes and amen and to sing the songs and pray the prayers and hear the word and say, yep, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it, and then yet when life happens later this afternoon or tomorrow, what's happening right here is something so different. I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I'm only trying to bring a word of encouragement today because this is the truth. This is the gospel. This is as good as it gets when it comes to what Christmas really means. Most of us have packed away all the Christmas lights. We've packed away the decorations. We're, we're moving on. But, but no, don't. Don't forget what it means to say the light of the world has come. And he still comes. Inviting us not only to see what he reveals, but to surrender our lives and our hearts to him so that he might bring the healing that only he can. Once again, Jesus said to Nicodemus, back to verse 18 of chapter 3, like we said, those who believe in the Son are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. What is the name of the only Son? Yeshua in Hebrew. Jesus is the transliteration from the Greek into English. 
You know what his name means? Yahweh is salvation. God saves. To believe in the name of Jesus Christ means you believe that he can and will do what his name says. If I claim to believe in Jesus, I must allow his light to shine in me, within my heart, trusting that whatever he may reveal, he alone has the power to repair it. Whether that would be my sin, or whether that would be my pain, or anything else that would tempt me to bind myself up and run back to hide in the darkness. Listen to me, it's becoming more and more unpopular today to talk about us as being broken as human beings. Do you know that? In fact, in some circles, to say that anyone is broken is deemed downright offensive. What, what, what's heard is encouraging today is say that you, you, you are complete. Everything you need is within you. Everything that you ever need for who you need to be your best self, you already have that. You just don't know it. That is the gospel according to secular humanism that is sweeping across millennial and Gen Z generations today. It is a gospel of death. Not eternal life. Forget the truth. We might as well say, feed my feelings, for they are my truth. And that's the problem. That's why we're creating a society where we all stay stuck in this reveal phase of what it means to trust in, believe in, and follow Jesus. Where we will do everything and anything we can think of to patch up the outside. That's why addiction is through the roof. That's why pornography and illicit sexual behavior, it's not that people are just evil. It's that people are doing whatever they can to try to find some way to ease the pain and find some sort of significance or meaning in their lives. G.K. Chesterton once said that every time a man knocks on the door of a brothel, he is looking for God, whether he knows it or not. We will do anything and everything to change all the stuff outside and never deal with what is inside. Have you noticed that? What's at the heart of the issue, at the core of who we are? But praise God, that's precisely as we've been saying, why Jesus came, why God chose through Christ to get to the very heart of the issue, at the very core of who we are. Jesus came to save us from our sins by the power of his blood and the power of his love poured out upon Calvary for you and for me. Because of that, we are delivered from the judgment of God if we will receive that gift. We know that, but there's more. We are not only saved as we are forgiven and pardoned, we are saved as God seeks to heal what is broken within us. Do you know that? It's not just about, I can go to heaven when I die. It's about, God, how are you going to work in my life now? The gospel is as good as that. In the New Testament, the, the word we translate sozo out of, out of Greek into, into save, it also means heal. So as we look at this next Portion. If God is going to reveal, God is going to repair. As Luke tells us in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, Jesus was defining his mission in the synagogue after he'd come out of the wilderness, and he quotes the prophet Isaiah. He says this. He stands up and says, this is fulfilled of him now and in him. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is why Jesus has come. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Do you know who's poor in the eyes of God? Every single one of us. Every single one of us. We lack everything unless we receive it from the Lord. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To proclaim, to reveal, so that God may do the work of repair. In Isaiah 61, one other thing that the prophet includes in this passage is that God will send the one who comes to bind up the brokenhearted. I really believe with all my heart that the, the most dire pandemic in the world today is not COVID-19, it's brokenheartedness. That is the real pandemic we face. But for God to address this, for this to happen, we cannot allow ourselves to be like those Jesus described back in John 3, verses 19 through 20, as we heard moments ago. And this is the judgment. This is the judgment that Jesus says. That the light has come into the world. That's him. And people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
For all who do evil hate the light. Why? Because the light reveals. What have you been saying? The light tells the truth. The light shows things as they really are. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. Hmm. Remember Jesus said only three verses earlier he did not come to condemn. He came to save. So do not run, my friends. When the light of Christ shines in your life, when his presence makes itself known to you, when he makes himself known to you, do not hide your heart from what his light and his love reveal. We don't trust anybody. We don't believe in anybody, including, if we're honest, most of us, ourselves. That's why today to preach a gospel of just trust God, that's why that's so hard. That's why people say, well, you got you to prove to me. What's, what's the evidence? How can I believe unless it's proven to me? When you hear somebody speak that way, oftentimes what that really means is everybody I've ever loved or trusted has disappointed me, has let me down, has used me or abused me. Or maybe they know themselves all too well and know that they have done that to those they were supposed to love, they were supposed to care for. When the light of Christ shines in our hearts, he doesn't just reveal our own sin, he will reveal the woundedness that's been inflicted upon us by others. That which is eating us from the inside out, like those yellow jackets at my house, <laughs> it has worked its way through our insides and it comes out in painful ways. Hurt people hurt people, you've heard that, right? It is true. It comes out in ways we don't wish to inflict upon those around us, even those we love, but it still happens. That's the very nature of sin. This is the, the pebble that drops in the pond and those ripples are spreading out and people hurt each other and hurt each other and hurt each other. It's like the Hatfield-McCoy's feud all over the place, but in real everyday life. That's the nature of sin. But how do you deal with sin? It has to be revealed. It has to be seen for what it is. That way we can see what needs to be done to be repaired, what needs to be done, and that, or that we might be saved, that we might be healed by God. So Christ comes to reveal and repair that brokenness in us too. So a few more pictures I want to share with you. So as I kept going, this is, as I kept moving and pulling out rotten insulation, pulling out uh, all these things that were, uh, you see the studs were rotten. Uh, what had happened was there was once upon a time an old uh, wall unit air conditioner there. Didn't get sealed up right. That's where, again, where that circle is, where the yellow jackets found that hole and it seemed like a good hollow in a, in a big tree that wasn't a tree at all. It was actually our house. But as I kept pulling things out, and it was a process of just removing and removing and removing, but then the repair began. After I treated everything for moisture and mold, after I had, had removed all that was rotten, all that was not going to be able to sustain that wall or the integrity of my family's house anymore, I began to just put the pieces together, a new seal plate, sister up those studs, put in new plywood and caulk it and seal it the way that it should have been done the first time. Next one, Brian. Thank you. Put insulation and a vapor barrier in there the way that it needed to be and also working on the outside to make sure that, that the hole had been patched, that everything was sealed up the way that it should be. Finally, the drywall went up. And lastly, the mud to cover the screws this is that process of, of being repaired. And so at night, after my family would go to bed, I'd try to be as quiet as I could, building this back together. And every evening that it took me to get this finished, just step by step by step, God would speak to me. And he would speak to me talking about, Ben, this is what I want to do in your heart. This is what I want to do in people's lives. And what I had first thought was going to be an interruption, where I'm like, I don't have time for this. Ben, how much is this going to cost, God? Why, why, why? This is ridiculous. Once God's like, are you done? Will you listen now? And I'll never forget what that lesson has taught me and continues to teach me. Continues. Because the last thing God wants to do is he reveals and he, as he begins to repair. He is being, bringing us to a place where he seeks to restore this is the good news of the gospel. God comes to restore you. He comes to restore me. He is coming to restore all of creation. That's the end of the story, right? 
The world doesn't just go to hell and burn. We believe that we are the beginning of new creation, that God is making all things new, and no matter how much the world may have to go through in the process, in the end, new heavens and new earth are God's good and right plan, where his kingdom, all the kingdoms of the world, shall become kingdoms of our God and of his king, who is Jesus Christ. That's where all of life, all of creation is headed, the restoration of all things. And listen, how that begins, Christ did not come to make you acceptable or loving to God. You know why? Because you already were, and you already are. You're already accepted by God. You're already loved by God. What did John say? For God so loved the world, even the world that rejected him, even the world that denied him, even the world that completely disobeyed him, God loves in that way. What did Paul say? For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The very ones who nailed him to the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. What kind of love is that? The question isn't, will God receive you? Will God receive me? The question is, will we receive him? When we judge ourselves, and that's what we do, we judge ourselves by rejecting God, by denying God. God doesn't have to just bring the gavel down and condemn you as guilty. No, when we push God away, when we run from God, when we would rather remain in the darkness than let his light reveal and repair and restore us, we are the ones who judge ourselves. We are the ones who choose no. I reject you, God. The life that you offer, the love that you extend. But God doesn't give up on us. When the light of the world shines in your life, receive him, welcome him, run to him, not away from him, and let him, as the master builder that he is, let him work on you and in you even when it hurts even when it hurts. Let him work in you to make you what you could become, which is greater than anything you could ever plan for yourself. That doesn't mean you're not enough for God. That, our, our culture today is so obsessed with, you know, tell me I'm enough, tell me I'm worthy, tell me I'm loved, tell me I'm accepted, and the answer is in Christ, in, in, in God, you, you are all those things. But that doesn't mean we all ain't got junk that God's gotta fix. It doesn't mean we don't have things in us that are broken, that are toxic, that are poisoning others and ourselves. When the light shines and reveals that to us, God comes to heal us, not to condemn us, to save us, not to destroy us. So let him work through you to enter into the hurt and the brokenness in your own life and to allow him to shine in your life to enter into the hurt and brokenness of others because that's the next step, right? That we all may be healed, that we all may be saved through Christ. God desires that none shall perish but that all should come to repentance, to see what it means to know him in and through Christ and know the eternal life that he alone brings. So when the light shines in the darkness, what happens? The light of God reveals the love of God repairs and the eternal life of God restores. Psalm 80, verses one through three, David wrote, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. That is the prayer, that is the song of David a thousand years before Jesus would come walk the face of the earth. The light shines in the darkness as a present and ongoing action and reality. That is who he is and that is what he does. And so as I bring this to a close for today, I want us to, to pray as we enter into 2022 as it really begins to unfold Christ Church, I, I want us to understand that God is inviting us to pray like David prayed. To cry out for his revealing light, his repairing love, his restoring life. 
Psalm 139 is one of my favorites, and, and just a few verses from the beginning and the end of that ver, uh, psalm, how it bookends. I, I want us to pray in this way, and, and this is how David prayed. He said, oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Really known me, known, known my sin. I can't hide anything from you, God. You know my, my weaknesses and my fears and my failures, but you also know my hopes and my dreams. You know how much I want to do what is right. You know how much I want what is best. You know how I have hurt those I love. You know how those I love have hurt me. You know all to you all hearts are open, all desires known. From you no secrets are hid. You have known me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way within me and lead me in the way everlasting, in the way eternal. The way everlasting, the way eternal. Again, a thousand years later, the way everlasting, the way eternal wouldn't just be something, it would be someone. The one who is the way, the one who is the truth, the one who is the life, the one who brings eternal life. So right where you are right now, whether you're in the room with us, whether you're with us online, what I want to invite you to do is I want you to, if, if you're willing, and I want to encourage you, be, be bold to pray in this way that, that David prayed. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. And when you invite the Lord to do that, and when he shines his light in your heart and reveals what he sees, do not be afraid. And do not reject him. Do not push him away. Believe in him. Trust in him. See as he gives you eyes to see and then surrender your life. Surrender your heart. Surrender all that you are and ever will be to him. That's what real faith does. That's what really being a follower of Jesus Christ means. And trust your life, trust your heart in the hands of the one who has come to reveal, who has come to repair, who has come to restore. And so right now, I want you to do that. Just ask the Lord to search you right now, right where you are. In Jesus' name. to you all hearts are open all desires known and from you no secrets are hidden Lord let your light shine upon us that we might be saved that we might be healed that we would turn to you Lord for salvation in every sense, that eternal life might begin in us even now. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for how you promise to receive us if we will but turn to receive you, Lord, you who have already stepped out of eternity, 
condescended, the Word made flesh to come and live among us as you still do by the power of you, Holy Spirit. So Lord, bring healing where healing is needed. Bring forgiveness, Lord, as we all stand in need of your forgiveness. Bring restoration, Lord, for that which is broken. Let us see it not only in ourselves, but in one another. Let us pray for it, not only in ourselves, but for one another. Not only in your church, Lord, but in the totality of your creation. For you have promised that all things should be made new. That one day the new heaven and the new earth, these shall be the fullness thereof. But it begins now in every heart, Lord, that will receive what you reveal. That will allow you to do the work only you can do. Hear our prayer now. And send us forth, Lord, in strength and faith, believing in who you are what you have done, what you are doing, and what you have yet promised to do. And in the name of the one, the name above all names, the name in which we are to believe, in the name of Jesus, we ask it, and we believe it. Amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may it indeed be so. Go in peace now to love and serve the Lord and one another. Thanks be to God.